You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Do you have a really clear strategy for your real estate portfolio and a clear vision of where you want to go? Most of us know we need this, but maybe we haven't taken the time to do it or we just simply don't know how. I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Well Show. Well, I've got great news for you. Our guest today has written the book on the topic. Dave Meyer wrote the book, Start With Strategy. And if you've heard his name, that's because he's really well known and you've probably heard his show. I'm a co-host on his podcast, On The Market with Bigger Pockets. And Dave has been with Bigger Pockets for a long time now, almost a decade. So he's been a, a co-host. He's been on the main Bigger Pockets podcast many times. Dave Meyer is the VP of Data and Analytics at Bigger Pockets, again, host of the On the Market podcast, and author of another book, Real Estate by the Numbers, great book, and now is out just this week with his new book, Start with Strategy. He's been a real estate investor since 2010, mostly in Colorado, but he lives in Europe, uh, so he's had to learn how to invest out of state. That's part of his strategy, and he loves using data to inform his investing. So Dave, welcome to The Real Well Show. It's so great to see you here. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here and excited that we're we're doing this. I actually can't believe this is the first time you've been on. So <laughs> I don't know. What I know. I so see long. you all the time. We're all, always recording. It feels like we should have done this a while ago. Yeah, but the timing's perfect because you've come out with another book, which I've got here. Start with Strategy. People don't really know who have people who haven't written books, maybe don't know what it takes to get one done. <laughs> so how long did this take you? <laughs> oh my God. I think it in, you know, in, in time span, maybe two years from like real outline to finish. And I just don't even know how many thousands of hours, but, uh, yeah. It's it really is uh, something you have to be very dedicated to. It takes a lot of effort and it's kind of a lonely process. I don't know if you felt that way, but uh, you can't really like share your feelings about it with anyone else. It's just kind of you slamming your head against a keyboard for a couple of years. <laughs> I, I actually love it when I can carve out the time. I feel like I get into this flow and uh, but, you know, carving out the time and getting into the flow, that's that's the challenge. But let's start with, you know, for those of you who don't know who Dave is, let's just go back to your origin story. And your <laughs> are you do you have a degree in economics? Or what's your background? No, I don't. No. So I, I have an undergraduate degree in political science and used that uh, not at all, I guess, <laughs> throughout my career. Um, but I do have a master's degree in something called business analytics, which is kind of like half like an MBA and half a data science, uh, like statistics program. And so I think the better way, uh, what I would call myself is not an economist, but more of like a housing analyst or an investment analyst. Yeah. And I don't have a degree in economics either, but here, here we are talking about the economy all the time. Yeah. But you know, you have to, if you are an investor, you got to know what's going on and you do need to be a student of the economy for sure, which is what we've done. So how did Absolutely. you, I, you know, yeah. I, I, failed to understand it, I think, for probably the first five or six years of my investing career and made a lot of mistakes as just making assumptions about the economy and what, you know, what cycles looked like and dedicated myself to learning it. And it's really helped a lot over the just building my own portfolio. Okay, so you ended up with this really incredible position at Bigger Pockets. So let's go back to when that happened and how that happened. Yeah, so I was uh, I started investing in 2010, sort of on a whim. Um, I wanted I really good timing, I Dave. So freedom. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was sort of a force of necessity um, because. Houses were cheap back then, but I was a year out of college and jobs were not easy to find. Uh, mm. And I wound up waiting tables for a while. I actually really liked that job, but it wasn't, you know, the career trajectory I'd hoped to be on. And so I was looking for some other ways to supplement my income and real estate sort of fell into my lap in, in, in a way. 
Um, and I was doing that sort of on the side for, you know, a couple of years and eventually got into tech, which is what I wanted to do. And after, you know, I was working at a job in 2016 and 2015, didn't love it. And just was like, I want to do tech and real estate. I, I like both of these things. And so I Googled tech real estate companies and I found bigger pockets. I had never been on bigger pockets, even though I'd been investing for quite a while. And it was like literally a mile from the house I was house hacking at the time. Um, and so I waited like six or nine months until they had a job that was uh, appropriate for me. And it was only like six employees at that time um, and finally got it. And uh, I've been there for almost eight years now. Incredible. All right. And was that at the beginning of Bigger Pockets kind of growth growth? Yeah, Bigger Pockets has actually been around since 2004, but it was sort of a hobby for our founder, Josh Dorkin, for the first like 10 or so years. It really started to take off, I think, in 2013, 2014, but they didn't really start hiring external employees, I think, till 2015. Um, so it was definitely the start of the big upswing. What number employee were you? I think it was like seven, maybe seven wow. or eight. Um, so definitely in the single digits. And I think at this point, I'm the second or third longest tenured employee. Oh my gosh. How many employees today? It's it's still relatively small. I, it's Not somewhere sure. between 80 and 100, I think. I think it's between wow. 80 or 100. Yeah, I'm so far removed from like HR. <laughs> from that part, um, yeah. And I, I, I work remotely, so I'm never in the office. Um, and I don't see all these people, but I think it's somewhere between 80 and 100. Yeah, yeah, just phenomenal growth. But the bottom line is you've seen that company go from really a startup to what it is today, which is the leader in real estate tech, I guess you could say, in, uh, in, in educating so many people. Millions. I think it's like 2 million on the list or something. I, I don't know. It's, it's incredible. I think we're almost about to hit 3 million. And when we started, wow. when I started, I think we were under, we were like at 100,000. So that's been a cool journey to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and I was so lucky somewhere around that time frame. Maybe maybe a few years later to get to be on the Bigger Pockets podcast, you were um, co-hosting that show with Brandon Turner. That's kind of when I first got to meet you. I'm sure you don't remember because you've interviewed so many people. And then uh, just a few years ago, <laughs> I do. Remember. I got a, You remember? Ah. <laughs> Well, I do remember because when we were casting for On the Market, I think I you had done that one, and then we had also. Maybe we did the first bigger news episode with you as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And that did, it was the first test of like talking about economics on the podcast. I think it was you, me, and maybe David um, and David Green. And yeah. And it did really well. And that was sort of the the first spark for what has become a whole part of Bigger Pockets. We now call the market intelligence team. And so you were a big part of that. Oh, so fun. And, and then you cast for, then you got your own podcast and I ended up on it and it's so much fun. I just love it on the market. If you haven't listened to it at bigger pockets, Dave is the host and it's just really current data news information interviews, similar to real wealth, but really just focused on, uh, what's on the market and, and, uh, the, the economy and data because you're the, the data guy. Yes, but we do have a lot of fun. We try and keep yeah. it light and uh, interesting. And Kathy is always a lot of fun. We also have uh, James Daynard and Henry Washington, other experienced investors. And so we uh, try and do our best to sort of mix between hard data and then like anecdotal stories about how that data is useful every day in your in your uh, investing ex uh, career. Yeah, it's so fun. It's so fun. So part of, and again, I don't know how you accomplish everything because you just came out with a, a book and now you have another book. Um, the, the book you wrote right before this is Real Estate by the Numbers. Did I get that right? That's right. That is okay. right. Yeah. Great book. Wow. If you want to just know how to do numbers <laughs> 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 and understand pro formas and it's, it's a big, thick book that will not be read in, in <laughs> one sitting. <laughs> 
But, yeah, uh, we recommend yeah. it. I wrote it with Jay Scott and we recommend it. You know, we wrote it that you can read it cover to cover if you want. Uh, but it's also meant really as a reference book. I, I literally was actually referencing it today. I was analyzing a deal and I was trying to remember what a loan constant was. And I don't memorize all these formulas. <laughs> and so I pulled out <laughs> my own book and used it as a reference. Um, and so uh, it's really good if you uh, like the number side of things, um, especially, you know, if you're doing sort of passive investing and want to understand how other people are under, you know, creating these assumptions and these projected returns that could be helpful to you. Yeah. And uh, really looking back at my real estate career over the past 25 years, the biggest mistakes I've made have been, you know, not fully understanding the numbers. So I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of, of getting through that book and, you know, just pick the sections that apply to you. Not all of it will. Um, but now, you know, we're here to talk about your second book, Start With Strategy. What inspired you to write this one? And and then let's talk about, you know, strategy, your strategy, my strategy, and, and how people can create their own. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I've always sort of been known as the data guy, but I, I think the reason I like data is actually because it supports the thing I truly am passionate about, which is uh, strategy and strategic thinking. And data is just one input to, you know, creating a great strategy for real estate or really in, in any sort of business venture. And I think strategy for real estate investors is super important because unlike investing in stocks or bonds, you know, real estate is entrepreneurship and you need to have a business plan. You need to have a business strategy. And it is difficult because I don't think most financial planners are sort of equipped to help people figure out the right real estate investing strategy for them. And there's so many different great ways to invest in, in real estate that it can be a little bit overwhelming. And so I wanted to create a book that was interactive, that you know provides background information, but also actually walks you through like step-by-step step, the questions you need to ask yourself, the decisions you need to make um, to create a strategy that is unique to your personal goals, your circumstances, your risk tolerance, and all that. And it's so important. Most people really just don't have one. They have an idea. They know, hey, I want to climb that mountain. Um, they, basically meaning I want to grow wealth. I want to be wealthy. I see other people own real estate. I hear all these stories on Bigger Pockets and on the Real Wealth Show about people who have created wealth, but they don't have a specific strategy. And, I, you know, honestly, I, Rich and I have been guilty about that, too. Although when I first started, I kind of had a vague one. And then 2008 hit. <laughs> that strategy got blown up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like um, that Mike Tyson saying, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Yeah. Yeah. That was like a full body punch. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, so you were inspired to, you know, kind of teach people how to, how to really have that strategy so that they can play to win. Um, let's, let's just kind of jump to this first section. I know there's several sections and the first is vision. Let's talk about that. That's right. So I think the, the, one of the biggest things that happens with especially newer real estate investors and even people who are scaling is you get really into acquiring deals and you kind of skip over the vision part, which is identifying why you're investing in the first place and what you're actually trying to accomplish. And what your vision is and what your goals are can vary dramatically from person to person. I'm sure you see this in your business, Kathy, all the time, but some people just want to buy a couple rental properties. Other people want to build a huge portfolio and participate in syndications and, you know, want to be a mogul. Other people just need a couple thousand dollars a month in passive income. And I think really getting clear about what you want and why you're investing is probably the most important part of building a successful strategy or portfolio. One, because it's motivating, right? Like if you know exactly what you want, at least for me, I find that super motivating and keeps me disciplined and working hard at the things I'm trying to accomplish. And two, it allows you, it gives you sort of this frame for decision making. Because when you get offered deals that may not make sense to you, you can more easily ignore them because they're not aligned with your vision and your goals. And when you find deals that are aligned with your vision and goals, it reduces some of the uncertainty and allows you to take action more quickly. And so I start the book and my own personal planning for real estate with, with this concept of a vision because it sort of 
you know, everything that every decision I make about my portfolio and every little tactic that I apply sort of stems from the long term goals that I'm trying to hit. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 so important <laughs> to have that that clear vision because there's too many great things out there. There's too many opportunities and and it could be really easy to feel the FOMO to just feel like I want to do what that guy's doing or I just heard this interview and I want to I want to be her or whatever it is and <laughs> it may or may not apply to you. Just a simple example is our syndication department at Real Wealth, we have a a fund, as you know about. It's um, it's lower returns, but you get really good tax benefits. So if you're somebody who needs tax benefits, this might be you know fit your vision. Uh, but the ones that seem to have that people clamor over are like my land development ones, like this current one. Uh, we we sold out our uh, land entitlement syndication in one webinar because, you know, oh it's a God. bigger hitter. Yeah. I it saw was that. I saw that. Congratulations, <laughs> by the way. That's awesome. Thank you. It was really wild. And I, you know, I think it's because the returns are high. It's short term. Um, but again, that strategy might not fit for everybody because while you're making a bunch of money, you're not really building that long-term wealth. You got to reinvest that money in two years. You know, it's a short-term project mm -hmm. with high returns. So, if you don't have a strategy, you're going to just be drawn to all the things. I'm not a, a strategy, but the, the vision. So give me like a clear, yes. let's talk about your vision. What's, what's your personal vision for your real estate portfolio? I think the best example I can give is uh, I talk a lot about time and how valuable time is uh, in the book. And I just believe in that. And so like one of the core tenets of my vision is that I will not spend more than 20 hours per month on my portfolio. I know people think that's crazy because I do real estate all the time. I talk about it all the time, but I would rather spend time. I like my full-time job, so I'm happy doing my full-time job. And, you know, I want to reserve time for my friends and for my family. And so I, that is like a key, maybe the most important part of my vision. And that just may, allows me to make decisions. Like, a lot of the things I do are invest in syndications and invest in funds because I, you know, if I'm going to flip houses then I can't stay under that 20 hour week limit that I want to create for myself. Um, so I think that's, that's the number one thing um, I focus on, but there are other things that are part of my vision that I think really help me make decisions too. Like one thing that I think is a common thing is in, in real estate investing is I intend to stay in my job and just knowing that and saying that out loud, like I keep plan to keep working for at least the next 10 years also allows me to make more decisions. Like I can take on more risk because I live off of my, my income from bigger pockets. And if, you know, a syndication doesn't go well for me, that stinks, but I can, you know, I can live with that. Um, if you are rely, you know, if you want to retire in two or three years, then you need to make more conservative decisions about what to do with your money. And so I think just going through some of these questions about your vision has really helped me figure out what deals are good. Um, and I think it, it really does help, um, all the other investors I've spoken to about this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. What, if you don't have that guiding light, um, to determine like, how do I want my life to really be? And how is real estate going to support me in that? Um, I've, I've put it, actually, we're putting it in our bigger pockets book that I'm so happy we, Rich and I get to be writing right now. And one is like looking at our real wealth members. We have some people who th their vision is just to have more free time. Kind of like you were saying, they just, they just want to a real estate portfolio that frees them up. They don't necessarily need great wealth. And for one member in particular, he just wanted $3,000 a, a month passive. That's, that's it. That would be that, that's the vision. And that 3000 yep. a month would cover the expenses so that he could be a full-time artist and not have the pressure of figuring out how I'm going to pay the rent. And that's like a super doable vision, right? Um, versus oh. I want to be a billionaire. <laughs> Yeah, right. And both good visions, like both are totally yeah. worth, you know, all of them are worthwhile. I think that's what's so cool about real estate is like you can customize it to whatever you want it to be. Um, but those, you know, their, their portfolios, because their visions are so different, like their portfolios are going to look really different, you know, and they're going to, um, 
pursue different types of deals. And that's okay because the vision sort of lets you narrow it down. You talked yeah. about, um, you know, that guiding light. There's this great book called The Paradox of Choice. I think uh, people, it basically means that people think that they want a lot of choice in their life. But all the research shows that like when, when you're presented with an abundance of choice, you actually make no decisions at all. Like most people get stuck and can't <laughs> yeah. do anything. And I think mm -hmm. this happens all the time in real estate, right? You see all these cool things to do and you wind up just getting overwhelmed. And so yeah. starting with a vision allows you to eliminate some of the choices and just yeah. focus. You still have some choice. Like there's still plenty of good options, but you just narrow it down and filter it down to just a couple of choices, all of which that might be good for you. Yeah, just puts the kind of the blinders on in a good way, like filters out all that stuff so you could just focus on the vision. All right, what's part two? And by the way, um, so people can, in the book, you, you walk them through how to create that vision, right? That's right. So yeah, in the book, there's basically, there's like a business plan template. I, I call it the prep. It's the personal real estate portfolio. And you can basically walk you through individual decisions that you need to make. Like what's your goal? What's your financial goals? You know, what's your risk tolerance? That kind of stuff. Once you have the okay. vision set, I, I do something called deal design. And that's sort of what we were just talking about. It's taking all the options for real estate and narrowing down just to the ones that work for you. And in, you know, most of the time in real estate, we talk about quote unquote, finding a deal and finding and identifying an individual property is super important, but I call it deal design purposely because I think there's more to this than just going and finding a physical structure. It's like, how, who's going to manage your deal? That's a strategic decision that really impacts your vision. Like by hiring a property manager, you're going to have a very different return profile, risk profile than if you manage something yourself. You also need to figure out what kind of neighborhood you're going to be. If you invest in an A-class neighborhood, that's low risk, probably lower reward. If you do a C-class, that's high risk, higher reward. And so you need to think about not just what building you're going to buy, but how you're going to operate your deal, how you're going to manage it, how you're going to finance it. Because this is where sort of the customization piece of real estate comes in. And again, it's just a simple filtering mechanism that allows you to say, like, some of these deals are good for me. Some financing options are good for me. Some neighborhoods are good for me. Others are not. And I'm just going to identify and literally write out, like in the book, you literally just write out the ones you're going to pursue. And at least for me, I don't know if you're like this, but I'm very visual. So for me, like just seeing the things I'm agreeing to do and the things I'm going to ignore is really helpful. So if someone sends me a deal and it's not on my board, I'm not thinking about it that year. Maybe I'll come back to it again in the future. But for that year, like I've made my decision and I'm just going to execute on what I decided I want to do. Yeah. Well, you had us, you know, all the co-hosts of On the Market fill this out. And I just thought I would breeze through it because I teach this stuff and we're writing a book on it. I just, <laughs> you know, thought, okay, I'll, it'll be easy. But the questions you ask are really um, you know, there, you have to dive deep and it took us a little bit more time, but the clarity was there uh, as a result of that time. And when I say time, I mean, it's not going to take you weeks. It's just, you have to sit down and focus for maybe an hour or two, but it, you know, the, the, the questions are maybe the questions you haven't asked yourself. And so we really love doing this together, Rich and I just sitting down and, and like, wow, we hadn't thought of that one. And oh, this is good, you know? So, um, so you, you put the framework in the book. So it's, it's a vision and then deal. What was it? Deal? Deal design. The, deal design. And then what? Yes. And then the last one is portfolio management. And I think this is maybe the most, you know, vision people skip over, but portfolio management, I think, is one of those things that people need to pay more attention to because yeah. it is fun to buy deals. But man, yeah. so much of the performance of your portfolio is how well you operate your existing portfolio. And that's really, I, I think, the most important part of portfolio management. The book gets into all the details, but I think the, the most important thing, if I could sum it up, is adopting a mindset of like optimization and just, you know, uh, thinking about how am I using my resources? Like, how am I using my capital? Is it going to the highest and best use in pursuit of my goals or certain deals lagging behind? Am I taking on the right amount of risk? You know, how's my time being used? Am I spending too much time on a deal that isn't earning me great money? 
And how are my skills being used? You know, am I a great networker? Am I using that fully to grow my portfolio? And if you're interested in learning more about some of the specific things you can do, I have plenty of exercises and tools, but I think that's really the thing about portfolio management is just constantly thinking about how can I make my portfolio better? That includes buying new deals, but it also includes refinancing and selling and self-education and all these different things that really go on behind the scenes to make a portfolio run for the long term. Yeah. And that in includes looking at it, you know, not just, this isn't a stock you buy and forget about, you know, you need to look and, and <laughs> say, Oh, I, I made, I made a bunch of money on this property. Maybe I should put that equity to use somehow, or, or this property is not performing at all. Maybe I need to dump it. <laughs> right. Exactly. I was talking to someone yesterday and, uh, we were talking about, it's shocking to me how many people analyze a deal when they buy it and then never again. It's like, mm -hmm. I think it's like the majority of people, which is crazy to me because you need to be constantly analyzing your deals in my mind, not constantly, but I think for me, I do it once a quarter, you know, I'll look at mm -hmm. my different deals. It takes 30 minutes. It's not like a huge big deal, but you just update some numbers. What are you getting for rent? You know, have you had any vacancies, any big op, you know, expenses and just see like what deals are good. And that's how you can, that's sort of the basis for good portfolio management. As you're saying, how would you know if you should sell a property if you're not continuously looking at it? <laughs> how should you know yeah. if you should refinance or, you know, buy a new one in your neighborhood? Because maybe you're looking at deals and the ones that you bought that are similar aren't doing so good. And maybe you need to pick a new market. So I think that's really the foundation of it is, is looking at your own portfolio. And then I think the second thing to do once you know what's happening in your portfolio is do what you and I do and talk about all the time, which is sort of look externally and try and figure out how does your portfolio compare to the deals that you can get elsewhere? Like if you bought a new deal, would it be better than the average in your portfolio or would it be worse? Because if it'd be worse, maybe you're better off investing that money back into your existing deals or putting it in a lending fund, you know, whatever it is. So I think those that's really sort of the crux of it is just having that discipline to do some analytical work and really just figure out like, where you stand and what opportunities are available to you. Yeah. And in, in the tracking, you know, I'm guessing the reason why you only have to look at your whole portfolio every quarter is because you're keeping up with it every day. And, and that, that was really the game changer for us is it was becoming too much for us to manage. So we hired a bookkeeper and we just send everything to them and exactly. they just make sure yeah. that everything's handled, that the insurance is paid and the, you know, that we've got the best insurance. It's the cheapest and blah, blah, blah. Like somebody's managing it. You do have to have a large enough portfolio that that makes sense, you know, that because you're spreading the cost of that book, bookkeeper on, you know, across all the, all the homes, you wouldn't need that for one, right? <laughs> you, you need enough. Uh, yes. But that, that makes it a lot easier because it's all it's just a glance. Like you can see, oh, this property generated this much income and had this much expenses. I know if it's performing or not. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think investing in a bookkeeper is one of the best investments you can make as an investor. Yeah. It took me way too long to do it. <laughs> just doing it myself in QuickBooks and I'm so bad at it and just mm -hmm. not good at keeping receipts and stuff. And you know, you can do it. I think when I first hired someone, it was as cheap as maybe 50 bucks a month. And I know that eats into your cash flow, but I think honestly, oh, it's worth it. you will earn <laughs> more than that per year, just in the opportunities you identify, you know, the late fees you avoid the, you know, everything like that. It is absolutely worth it because then you can spend your time doing the more important thing, which is like, okay, I know someone's already calculated all the, you know, kind of the boring stuff for me. And so now I could say like, all yeah. right, this deal is doing X, Y, Z this year. I could get this other deal. I could, you know, refinance and it allows you to have the more fun stuff, which is the strategy, right? To me, that is very enjoyable. And it, it's the, joyous part of real estate to me is like running the business and thinking about how you can grow and change things and, and let keeps gets you less bogged down in sort of the mundane data entry. Yeah. Okay, Dave, well, any last thoughts for our listeners on, on uh, starting with strategy? 
No, thank you so much. I think, you know, the main point that uh, if you read the book or not, I uh, really want to get across and why I was so interested in writing this book is just to really run your own race. You know, there's a lot of different ways to run, invest in real estate, but I really just strongly believe in, you know, thinking about this and figuring out how to make real estate work for you and not trying to, you know, hit your horse to someone else's bandwagon. Um, real estate is like a personal thing. It's super customizable and that's the fun of it. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And, and, uh, you know, manage your emotions when on social media, because <laughs> there's a lot of people <laughs> yes. who, who maybe, maybe they built yes. an enormous portfolio. Maybe they're lying about it either way. Uh, they may or may not be living their, the, the vision that you want, you know, the vision that you want, that's all that matters. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Dave. Well, thank you for being with me here on The Real Wealth Show. Thank you for choosing me for your podcast on the market. It's a blast. And uh, and thank you all for joining us here on The Real Wealth Show. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Once you're there, you can join. It's free and you'll get access to hundreds of free webinars to help you on your journey. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.